We're going to be doing something a little different. We're finishing up our series on three C's to overcome obstacles. Uh, we're looking at the final one today. But just a quick recap uh, for those who weren't here for the previous two. And then uh, we're going to pause and just listen to this testimony of someone who has overcome huge obstacles uh, and still has a faith in God that is unshakable. And then we will conclude with the final C this morning. Remember we said it's what's inside us that ensures defeat overwhelming obstacles or pressures. That it's Jesus who is in us. The Bible tells us that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And so we remind ourselves that we have not only the Holy Spirit living within us, but the whole Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, because you can't separate them. And Jesus said, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. And then we moved on and we spoke about the first C. We spoke about courage. And we were talking about the fact that courage is needed to face many of the obstacles that life throws at us. And we used Joshua as one of the examples that he had incredible obstacles still to face. That in the years in the wilderness, the number of giants had increased. The numbers of walled cities had, had been fortified and strengthened. That the obstacles they were going to face were greater than when he investigated the land 40 years earlier. And yet he had the courage to do so. And so we learned some lessons from uh, Joshua. We learned that we can be courageous because of God's promises. God has said to us that he will always be with us. That His grace is sufficient for us. Second Peter three nine, nine uh, sorry, Second uh, Peter one. He has given us everything we need for life and godliness. He has given us everything we need, and we can take courage from that. Secondly, we can be courageous because of God's presence. If God is for us, who can be against us? Thirdly, we can be courageous because of God's previous works. And what we suggested was that we reflect on the things that God has done in our past because the things that God has done in our past, He will do in our future. That God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That God never changes. And what He has done, He will do again. And we can look forward to that. And so we can be courageous. The second thing we spoke about was character. And we spoke about Samson, do you remember? Samson was a man who didn't have character. And we used him as a good example of a bad example. Sometimes they use you as a good example of a bad example too, but not today. Just Samson. And the lessons we learned from Samson were, your character is shaped by the small decisions you make. It's interesting that the enemy never wants us to commit murder first up. He just wants you to dislike your neighbor firstly. And then it grows from there. And it's the little decisions we make, the things that we choose not to resolve. Your character is what God knows you to be. Your reputation is what people think you are. When you go to a funeral service, you hear a lot about what people think about the person. Most of them are lies because you always speak well of the dead. But you know what? Sometimes you just got to tell it like it is. And that's what God does. God never lies to us. He always tells us the truth. The story of Samson is insightful because his breakdown in character didn't happen all at once. We journeyed with him through those little decisions right from the first time he was hanging out in a vineyard when he was a, a, a Nazarite and should have had nothing to do with grapes or anything to do with um, the fruit of the vine. And so it progressed from there right up until the end. And we said that people who play around in gray areas get a lot of attacks from the lion. And we spoke about the lion attacking him in the vineyard. 
But he slowly compromised to the place where eventually he tells Delilah that the secret of his strength is that his hair has never been cut. His strength wasn't in his hair. His strength was simply his devotion, his commitment to God that was symbolized by his hair. But slowly that had been eroded and eroded by the decisions he had been taking, the things that he had done. Eventually he gets to the place where he says to her, if you cut my hair, I'll be as weak as anybody else. So she gets the barber and he and gives him a baldy. And he wakes up, and the scripture says in Judges 20, when he woke up, he thought, I will go as before and shake myself free. But he did not realize that the Lord had left him. What a tragic place to be. So far from God that he didn't even know that he was far from God. And you know what, that's what those little decisions do in our lives when we choose to do things that we know are not right. One of the things I'd like to say to you is sin is never an accident. Sin is always a choice. For the Bible tells us that when you know what the right thing to do is and you don't do it, that is sin. And what Scripture is simply saying is that it isn't an accident. It's a choice that you make. And we need to recognize that the little things lead to bigger things. And Samson, we saw, ended up in a terrible place, chained with his eyes put out. God's here a bound, blind, and entertaining the Philistines. And what we said was gifting isn't enough. Courage isn't enough. Anointing isn't enough. Character is essential. And we remember the story of how right at the end of his time, he looks back to God and says, God, I'm sorry. Give me strength one more time. Character can always be rediscovered. But you know what? It's through the hard times that character is fashioned and shaped. Things don't always go well. It's not like we're living in a bed of roses. There are plenty of thorns in that bed of roses. Life doesn't always turn out uh, to be what we plan. But you know what? If you have courage and you have character, you're far down the road to experiencing victory in your life. I want us to listen to the story of a man I know personally, I led him to Jesus Christ many, many years ago. He's younger than me. He and um, at that time, his partner and little girl turned up at church one Sunday. And the funny thing was, it was just him, his wife, his little girl, Meryl, and me. Nobody else turned up that night. So we invited them in, and while we were talking, the Lord said to me as clearly as anything, he said, these people have come because they want to get married in a church. They've not come because they're interested in me. And so I looked Derek in the eye, and I said to him, you know what, you're only here because you want to get married. His jaw just about hit the ground. And he acknowledged the truth of that, and he had an encounter with God that changed his life and his family. Eventually they were married. And he went on in leaps and bounds as he grew in courage and in character as he followed the teachings of the Lord. Some years ago, he was diagnosed with leukemia and has struggled on and off with it through many years. But this last year has been particularly difficult. And his... Um, Resources were severely tried. Beginning of this year, Derek passed away to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, it was uh, as a result of COVID and the weak immunity he had because of the um, leukemia that affected his uh, Ability to fight. But listen to this. It's about seven minutes long. Listen to this man just before he dies. And what he says. And just see his courage and character. 
And you're going to see in his life the third characteristic we're going to look at as well. Good morning again, dear Glenridge family. It's Derek here. I can honestly say I genuinely miss you all and long to see you all again one day. Hopefully that day comes sooner rather than later. Some thoughts. I am tired, Lord. I am tired of being sick. I am tired of being in the hospital. It's been four times already, already in 11 months. Surely, Lord, surely, Lord, enough. I am tired of the sorrow and the loss around me. I have lost two treasured and very dear friends this last month to COVID. My one ultra close friend of 26 years, Lord. Someone I spoke to daily, sometimes five times in a day. Yes, he was my boss but he was also one of my very closest friends. My other friend I've known for 22 years, Lord. We ministered together in Phoenix. We shared meals with her and her family. We shared celebrations and memorials. We were close, Lord. My nephew Mark was extremely ill with COVID just this month, Lord. I was struggling again, Lord. Can I take much more? Friends, that's the conversations I sometimes, thankfully not often, have with God. Open, raw, real, honest conversations. Even though I know that He knows what I'm thinking before I think it, I'm learning to have these real raw, honest conversations with God. They refresh me. So long as you don't stay there. Because then we can consider Scripture and let's look at Scripture together. In 2 Corinthians 13, Paul was aware of his very own weaknesses. But he was even more aware of Jesus' power. Reading from verse 9 in the NIV, it says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The message puts it this way. My grace is enough. It's all you need. My strength comes into its own in your weakness. Once I heard that, I was glad to let it happen. I quit focusing on the handicap and began appreciating the gift. It was a case of Christ's strength moving in on my weakness. Now, I take limitations in stride and with good cheer. These limitations, they cut me down to size. Abuse, accidents, opposition, bad breaks. I just let Christ take over. And so the weaker I get, the stronger I become. Friends, I can honestly relate to that scripture. You know, there's times when I feel weak. There's times being vulnerable, I feel lonely. I've been at home for most of the last 18 months. I've worked all day in a little office here in my house, pretty much on my own all day the last 18 months. There are times when I feel like giving up, although thankfully very seldom and for very short moments, but they've happened, they've come. You know that... 2 Corinthians 13 scripture that I just read, it reveals His grace. It reveals God's grace. Authority in Christ is so often learned through weakness. Our very own weakness. Examine yourself first and get real with God about your faith. Be real and raw. Challenge yourself and allow God to reveal 
and open beautiful doors of victory in your weakness. Here's a poem I recently heard which was written by a pastor in America named Chris Langham during a trial of uh, a, a, a trial of his. Faith. Faith is a fight and I intend to stand. Though life strikes hard and doubt draws blood, I will lift my head and beat my chest for I tend to stand. Hope. Hope is a rhythm and I, tend, I intend to dance when the melody of God's promises fills the room and the reality of heaven awakens my heart. I will not stand at the wall for I intend to dance. Life. Life is a story and I intend to live it. Though chapters end and tragedy scars the page, I will persevere. I will read on, for I intend to live. Love. Love is a symphony, and I intend to play. Love is a passionate explosion of emotion and compassion, of laughter and joy, and tears of sacrifice, and heartbreak, and healing, and mercy, and kindness, and purity, and commitment, and determination and the holy God who puts an instrument in my hands and notes on my page and lifts his baton. Love is a symphony and I intend to play. Death. Death is an end and I intend to live on when this old heart slows and the sparkle in these eyes fades. I will stand anew with eyes aglow. I will lift them up to see at last the one who, give me faith, who gave me faith to stand and hope and to dance. The one who gave me life to live and a love song to play. The one who died to destroy my death, who broke my heart to make it whole. Jesus, the love who saved my soul. I close with a prayer. Father, thank you. Thank you for life. Thank you for hope, for faith, for joy. It all comes from you, Father. Without you, we are nothing. With you, we are everything. Today, we'll dwell on that once again. We'll live a life worthy of your name. Once again today, Lord, we love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, dear friends. And today, Derek is dancing in the presence of God. You see, adversity is what shows what we're really like. You don't need courage when there's no challenge. You don't need character when there's no challenge. And you know what? You need no commitment when there's no challenge. And I want to speak about commitment for a little while. When the Spanish explorer Hernando Cortes landed in Veracruz, Mexico in 1519, he was so committed to conquering Mexico and um, laying hold of its vast treasures that he burned his ships on the beach in front of all the people who'd come with him. And simply what he was saying is, we either win or we die, but there's no going back. And what sometimes I think as Christians, we need to make that same determination. That, Lord, I'm going to live for you or I'm going to die. But there is no turning back. The Old Testament has an amazing story about commitment. And it's about a lady that we would never have heard about, I'm sure. Her name is Rizpah. Have you ever heard of her? Rizpah. Let me see your hand. Rizpah. One hand, two hands. 
Rizpah is an interesting lady, and we're going to learn some lessons from her life this morning. Um, in 2 Samuel, her story starts in 2 Samuel 21.1. And it says, there was famine during David's reign and lasted for three years. So David asked the Lord about it. And the Lord said, the famine has come because Saul and his family are guilty of murdering the Gibeonites. Now, if you know your Old Testament, the Gibeonites were Canaanites who were tricky heirs. What they did was they, they put on their oldest clothes with holes and all the rest of it in. They got their moldy bread and all their food that was going off and they loaded it on their donkeys and made it look like they'd come from a far way away. And they came to Joshua and said, we're from a far distant place and we would like to make a treaty with you. And uh, because we know that God is on your side. And so Joshua, one of the times he never consulted God, made the treaty. And God said to him immediately, these are not from far away. These people are from near. But you have to abide by the terms of the treaty that you've made with them. You cannot kill them. And so they became servants to the Israelites. But eventually... Saul, the king, in his zeal, broke that covenant. And he killed the Gibeonites, exterminated them from Israel. And now there was a famine. You see, when we break our covenants, there's always a consequence. When we commit ourselves to something, it doesn't matter who or what it is. Every time we break our commitment, there is a consequence. So David is now king and he goes to the Gibeonites and he says to them, how can I compensate you for the wrong that King Saul has done to you? And they didn't want silver or gold or anything like that. They didn't want land. They wanted Saul's seven sons killed and hung. Pretty raw justice. Consider with me the actions of Saul's concubine, Rizphal. A concubine was an informal wife whose commitment and love for her sons eventually won through. In verse 9, the men of Gibeon executed them on the mountain before the Lord. So all seven of them died together at the beginning of the barley harvest. Then Rizpah, a daughter of Aya, the mother of two of the men, spread burlap or uh, canvas uh, or, or sacking on, on a rock and stayed there the entire harvest season. She prevented the scavenger birds from tearing at their bodies during the day and stopped wild animals from eating them at night. This mother, out of love for her sons and a desire to see them get a proper burial, put, on, put some uh, sacking on, on a rock. Sacking was a sign of mourning and of repentance. And she spent her days chasing away the scavenging birds. And at night, she spent her days chasing away the wild animals that came to eat the flesh of her uh, two sons. These seven men hung on the tree from the beginning of the barley harvest, which would have been April, until the first rains come, which would have been in October. So this mother stayed on the rock protecting the bodies of her children for between five and six months while their bodies decayed and turned black from the searing heat. All she wanted was a proper burial for her children. And so she protected their bodies from the vultures and from the wild animals. It must have been soul destroying to sit there for six months under the cloudless day and in the heat of Israel. And if you've been to Israel in summer, you will know that it is a hot place to be. For five or six months, she was totally committed to what she believed in. She was fatigued. She was misunderstood. But she stayed out there. She hung on. She, people thought she was crazy. But she was committed to doing what she believed was right. 
And so she remained there until there were no further claims on her son's body, until the rains of the harvest fell. Can you imagine what it must have been like for her? All the horror of what was happening to the bodies, and yet she stayed. Verse 11, when David learned that Rizpah, Saul's concubine, had done, he went to the people of Jashub Gilead and retrieved the bones of Saul and his son Jonathan. When the Philistines had killed Saul and Jonathan on Mount Gilboa, the people of Jabesh Gilead stole their bodies from the public square of Beth Shan, where the Philistines had hung them. So David obtained the bones of Saul and Jonathan, as well as the bones of the men the Gibeonites had executed. Then the king ordered that they bury the bones in the tomb of Kish's father, uh, Kish, Saul's father, as the town of, at the town of Zila in the land of Benjamin. After that, God ended the famine in the land. You see, when David found out about Rizpah's commitment and vigil, his heart was moved. You see, he was a father who had lost a son. You remember his, son with, uh, his sin with Bathsheba? And you remember the baby that was conceived became sick and eventually died. He know, knew what heartbreak was like. And then he had um, his son rebel against him, Absalom. And, and he had to flee for his life. And Absalom uh, demeaned him in the eyes of all the people. He knew what it was to be brokenhearted. And when he saw the commitment of this woman, his heart was moved. You know what, people of God, I want to tell you what, it's when people see our commitment to God in the face of incredible obstacles that their hearts are moved to. They don't want to see you celebrating during the good times. Anybody can do that. They want to see you as you remain committed during the tough times. Some years ago in Ariwa, as um, a family in the church came and asked if I would go and visit with their family who were up from down south in the North Island. Their little child, a little baby, was desperately ill. And they didn't expect it to live. By the time I got there, the baby had passed away. And around the bed were gathered the grandparents, the parents, brothers and sisters, cousins, all sitting around the bed of this little baby that had just died. And as I came into the room, there was a real hush in the place. And I just asked if I could pray for the family, and they were very happy for me to do that, and so I prayed with them. And when I got to the end of it, one of the brothers picked up a guitar and began to play a worship song. And as he played, the family began to sing. And it was just one of the most powerful times of worship I have ever been in. You give and take away. You give and take away. But my heart will truly say, God is good. You see, that's what commitment is about. Commitment is standing when everybody else around you is giving up. Commitment is, is standing when others are misunderstanding you. And as I looked at this, this woman guarding the bodies of these seven young men, I'm sure she went through misunderstanding and she went through boredom and she went through loneliness and must have gone through attacks and she must have gone through ridicule and humiliation and, and, and through blessings and through times of incredible fatigue. But she stood firm. And people of God, I want to tell you what, I believe that we need to develop a backbone again. That we need to learn to stand for what we believe in again. 
that we need to learn not to compromise in the face of the ridicule and the fatigue that so often comes our way as we stand against the opinions of people who don't know and don't love God. You see, it takes courage. It takes character. But it also takes commitment to stand in the face of overwhelming obstacles. A.J. Gordon writes, It was seven years before Kerry baptized his first convert in India. It was seven years before Judson won his first disciple in Burma. It was seven years that Morrison toiled before the first Chinese person was brought to Christ. It was seven years before Moffat saw the first evidence of the Holy Spirit moving on the lives of the Betuanas of Africa. It was seven years before Henry Richards won his first convert at Banza Manteca. You see, what we're saying is, We live in a world of of instance where we want to see the answers. We want to see God come through. We want to see it all happen now. And God's plan and time is different to ours. We've got to learn to be committed. We've got to learn to stand firm. We've got to learn to refuse to give up faith. Even when we're facing insurmountable odds, God is still the same God. And we need to hold on. We must learn to commit our lives and our future into His hands. Remembering that He has said that He is faithful to God that which we commit to Him until the day that we stand in His presence. You see, commitment is one of the priorities in the Christian faith. You have to hold on to your passion and fire and not allow it to be quenched by anything. Not allow your convictions to be changed by the arguments or the discussions or the circumstances. You know what? It's hard to keep your passion and fire going When you're surrounded by people who look like they've had a wet week. It's true. And many of the folk that we live among right now are going through some of the hardest times in their lives. They have very little to celebrate and very little to be excited about. Because of all the restrictions and difficulties that have come in their lives. And you know what? It's easy for us to be just like them. It's so easy to allow the pressures of life to so overwhelm us that we lose our commitment to joy. That we lose our commitment to Jesus. And to the recognition that greater is He that is in us than He that is in the world. It's so easy for us to lose our way and to lose our passion for God in a world that is so passionless. And that's why I tease you a lot about being New Zealanders. Because you come from good British descent. And you don't ever do much about demonstrating your enthusiasm or excitement. It's sort of, yay. That's nice. That's good. I'm so pleased about that. And and I just want you to know that sometimes you've got to let the fire out. That people want to see your commitment. They want to see your zeal. They want to see your passion for God. They want to see it and they want to hear it. It's no good believing in something and then being half-hearted. It's no good this, this woman, Rizfa, uh, deciding that she would guard the bodies for a day or a week or, or, or a month even. She knew that she needed to see this through to the end. And people of God, we've got to see this through to the end. There is coming a day when we, like Derek, will close our eyes on this world. And we need to do it with our commitment held high with our passion for God blazing in our faces as we surround the body of a dead baby and celebrate the goodness of God to us anyway. 
Eventually, as the family stopped singing, I quietly made my way out. And I found a group of nurses standing outside with tears streaming down their faces, saying, how can they sing when they've lost their baby? I'll tell you how. Because God gives us a song. God gives us the ability to rise above. God gives us the ability to win. And God's looking for us to be committed to finding His sufficiency in everything that we face. It may be seven years that you've got to wait. But will you still be trusting God? Will you still be standing firm? You see, we've got to hold on to our passion and fire in the midst of a society that's losing their way and losing theirs. To me, it's really significant that Rizfa means a burning coal. God wants us to be committed to being burning coals for Him in this world that we live in. And so, as we sum up, you need courage, you need character, and you need commitment. Those are the three C's for overcoming. Courage, if you want to face obstacles with courage, find a promise that covers your need, because God's promises never fail. And He has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So if God be for us, who can be against us? Character. Your character is formed by the daily decisions you make. Not the big ones, although they have an impact too. It's those little things that you choose to do or choose not to do that set the tone of your character. And finally, commitment. We must learn to commit things into His hand and to stay committed no matter what. Do we really believe that God is good? We've got to learn to stay the course. We've got to learn to hold on to our passion and fire and not let go. We've got to learn to be courageous in the face of intimidation. We've got to learn to be upright when facing the pressures to make wrong decisions. And we've got to be committed to God and His Word above all else in life. And with those three C's, you too will close your eyes on this life with a sense of victory. Knowing that you can stand in the presence of God because of what Jesus has done, because of His blood that was shed for us. And because of the courage that he gave us. Because of the character that he formed in us. And because of the commitment that we held on to. Because do you remember what Jesus said? Those who endure to the end will be saved. Do you get that? Does that talk about commitment? Those who endure to the end will be saved. Let us be among those people who are going to be enduring and we're going to start to learn even though we might be New Zealanders to be a little more boisterous and a bit more fiery and a bit more demonstrative about this God that we love and serve. And you know what? I'll come in here and have a heart attack if I see that happen. Because I've been going at you for three years and it's made no difference yet. But no, no, it's not true. I see the odd little smile come out now and then. But just, just the corner of the lips. But it's happening. We're making progress. But you know what, people of God, we can face uncertainty because God has given us courage. God is working on our character and because we're committed to the end of our lives.